Many artists have depicted Montana's natural beauty, from the majestic mountains in the western part of the state to the wide open spaces of eastern Montana. No artist, however, has done a better job of capturing the spirit of Montana's early years than has Charlie Russell. And fortunately, for the people of his beloved home state, the Montana Historical Society in Helena has a world-class collection of Charlie's art available for everyone to enjoy. Most Montanans know the work of our famous cowboy artist, and we think we know the story behind his incredible paintings and sculptures. But one person knew Charlie better than anyone else. That person was Nancy Cooper Russell, Charlie's wife and business manager, who played a key role in his success. And Nancy has a version of Charlie's story to tell that is all her own. Every time I come to Helena, I visit the Montana State Capitol. It's such a grand old building, built in 1902. One of Charlie Russell's paintings hangs here in the House of Representatives chamber, a mural that some consider his masterpiece. Well, I know a little bit about Charlie Russell and this painting. I'm Nancy Russell, Charlie's wife and business manager, and I'm thrilled to spend some time with you talking about Charlie's life and work. We had many years together creating his legacy of art and stories so that the future would know about the American West through Charlie's eyes. It's a time in our history that he didn't want anybody to ever forget. And there it is. It's called Lewis and Clark Meeting Indians at Ross's Hole. And it portrays an event that happened in 1805 when Lewis and Clark were on their great journey west to find passage to the Pacific Ocean. It must have been quite an occasion for both parties, and Charlie does something here that he does in many of his paintings. Tells the story from the Indian's point of view. You know, Charlie believed that the Indians were the only real Americans, and that everyone else came here from somewhere else. Lewis and Clark are here, in the background, meeting with the Salish leaders, figuring out how to communicate and trade for what they need, and here, in the foreground, capturing our attention, the young men of the tribe, excited about these strangers in their midst. This was an experience to celebrate, and they would remember this day and tell stories about it for the rest of their lives. Well, that's one way to look at it. Charlie created his paintings so the viewer, the ones looking at it, could relate to the story and imagine what might happen next. Just look how big it is. Charlie had no idea if he'd be able to handle a canvas of this size. Why, we had to raise the roof on the studio just to get it in there. Now here's a picture of Charlie's studio, and that's Charlie sitting on the rail out front. Charlie always wanted a log cabin like the one he stayed in as a young man when he first came to Montana in the 1880s. So we had this studio built for him right next door to our house in Great Falls. <laughs> and there's a picture of me taken many years ago, standing inside the studio with some of Charlie's art. I look pretty serious there, but what do you think of that hat? It was quite a style back then. Oh, but I've gotten off track now. Let's get back to Charlie's mural. Here's a picture of him working on it inside the studio. It took up from floor to ceiling. He's standing on sawhorses here, but he had to use a ladder for some of it. Charlie loved history. He read his copies of the Lewis and Clark journals until they were in tatters. Here's another story from the Lewis and Clark journey. The Hidatsa Indians meeting York for the first time. Captain Clark brought his slave, York, along on the expedition. The Hidatsa had barely seen white men, so a black person was indeed a sensation. Clark wrote about their curiosity, and Charlie imagined what it was like in the lodge when they discovered that York's skin color was truly not going to rub off. An encounter among humanity, and we are left imagining what were they thinking of each other? What were they feeling in this moment? Charlie gave York to the Montana Historical Society in 1909. Now, we are in the art business, and you can't make a living in that business or any business if you give away your work. But that was Charlie for you. He wanted to make sure that painting stayed here in Montana. 
The Montana Historical Society actually has a very large collection of Russell art in the McKay Gallery, and it's right across the street. Let's go over and take a look at it. You know, the Montana Historical Society is one of the oldest museums in the West. It was founded in Virginia City in 1865, so it's been around for more than 150 years. Before they built this building, the Society's collections were located in the state capitol, just like Charlie's big mural. In addition to Charlie's art, you can come here and see all kinds of treasures from Montana's past. It's a wonderful place to visit and spend time. Well, here's where it all started. Back when Charlie was a cowboy in the Judith Basin, the terrible winter of 1886-87 took a terrific toll on the cattle on the open range, eventually killing 60% of them that winter. The owner of the ranch that Charlie was working on sent word out to the range that he wanted to know exactly what the conditions were for his livestock. The ranch foreman was struggling with trying to write a letter telling the owner just how bad it was. When Charlie took a little piece of cardboard, painted this on it, and said to include it with his letter. The foreman said, well, that picture says it all. I don't need to write anything. When the owner got the picture, he got the message. A starving cow on its last legs, surrounded by hungry predators. Then the owner passed the picture all around town, and right then and there was the beginning of Charlie's fame. This is one of Charlie's first paintings. A starving Indian family has killed and is butchering a cow that they stole from the huge herd that is off in the distance, and two cowboys have discovered them. Caught in the act is the title. Look at the expression on the face of the cowboy. What will happen next? This cow is the difference between life and death to this family, and there are many more cattle over the hill, and yet, Life for the Indians had already begun to change by the time Charlie got to Montana, but he still liked to paint pictures like this one, called Indian Hunter's Return, that showed the old ways, or buffalo days as they were often called. Actually, all of Montana was beginning to change by the time Charlie got here. Gold miners and railroads and settlers all brought changes that Charlie didn't like. All throughout his life, he preferred Montana at its wildest. Even though Charlie loved Montana so much, he wasn't born here as you might think. He was actually born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1864. Look here, I have a picture of him when he was small. In Missouri, Charlie grew up listening to and reading stories about the frontier and the Indians and the mountain men and the fur trappers who lived there. Look at this picture called Free Trapper. Even though he painted it many years later, it captures Charlie's dream from his childhood. It was his dream to live these stories just like they did. That's what he wanted more than anything, and he constantly begged his parents to let him follow that dream and come west. Finally, in 1880, when he was almost 16, his parents agreed to let him give it a try. They figured he'd be back within a year, that it would be too difficult for him to survive in the wilds of Montana. Much to Charlie's surprise, his first job after he got here was herding sheep for a man named Pike Miller, which he was terrible at. The sheep kept running away and he didn't go after them. Or as Charlie put it, I lost those sheep quicker than Miller could replace them. Then he lived with a hunter, Jake Hoover, and that's where he learned about wildlife and the natural world. When he was 18, he was hired as a night wrangler. Now that's a cowboy that watches the horse herds at night while other cowboys sleep. He was much better at watching horses than he was at watching sheep. He would tell you he wasn't the best cowboy at roping and riding and such, but he always found work because people loved having him around. Charlie was a good storyteller and kept folks entertained, weaving tall tales or drawing on whatever paper was available. Here's one of my favorite cowboy pictures, Bronk to Breakfast. Early morning in the cow camp, getting ready for the day, anything could and did happen. And Charlie loved recording such cowboy predicaments for everyone's enjoyment. This kind of story played out over and over on the range, and the viewer can imagine what will happen next. 
Charlie often used predicaments to tell a story. We've all been in predicaments. Those are problems or situations that are going to be tricky to get out of. When Charlie put his stories on canvas, he often put the viewer smack dab in the middle of a predicament so that they couldn't help but ask, what's going to happen next? Charlie painted this for Malcolm McKay, the man who this gallery is named after. It's titled The Roundup, and some say it's the best painting of a roundup ever made. Mr. McKay had it in his home back east, in a room dedicated to Charlie's art. Mr. McKay himself wanted to be a cowboy, and he understood Charlie's longing for another time. He loved the way Charlie portrayed the West, and he was one of Charlie's best customers. We met him and his lovely family in New York in 1911. He actually lived and worked there, but had a ranch in Montana. Over the years, he put together one of the best collections of Russell art there ever was. Artists need customers like Mr. McKay, called patrons. They buy the work that is already finished, and they request that the artist create a work just for them. That's called commission. Here's an example. Mr. McKay asked Charlie to paint a picture to hang over the fireplace in the Russell room back east. The result was Charlie Russell and his friends. Here's the picture as Mr. McKay displayed it. And here it is on view at the Montana Historical Society today, where everyone can enjoy it. When the McKay family was ready to find a new home for their collection, Montana spoke up loud and clear that they wanted this precious art to be in Montana, and they raised the funds to buy it and have it installed in Helena at the Historical Society for all to be able to visit and admire. Another way for Charlie to make a living with his art was by illustrating books and articles, making pictures to go with the story. After he was better known, lots of publishers and writers wanted him to illustrate their books because they knew his name as illustrator would help increase sales. One of Charlie's favorites is the Blackfeet story about how the buffalo lost his crown. It always tickled me that Charlie was so careful with his representation of the natural world, making sure it was realistic as possible. And here he has the animals conspiring with the Indian to change the order of power in the animal kingdom. The buffalo does indeed lose his crown in this story. Why don't you look it up because I think you will enjoy it. Some people think Charlie was a better sculptor than painter. He always had a piece of wax in his pocket that he could work on without looking at. You'd be talking to him, and then he'd bring out a little animal or figurine of some kind. When he was growing up, he'd steal bits of wax from his sister's wax flower project so he could practice. During his cowboy years, his bunkmates would tell of going to bed at night and waking up in the morning, and there's a little row of wax figures along the windowsill or the bed frame. He just couldn't keep his hands still. Art poured out of them. No matter where he went, young and old alike were fascinated by his ability to model. All his life, Charlie modeled these figures out of wax and sometimes clay. At my insistence, we also had some of those models cast in bronze, like this one here. It's called Smoking Up, and it's the first bronze ever cast of one of Charlie's models. He wasn't crazy about the idea because bronzes had to be cast at a foundry. We used ones in New York and California, and this meant that Charlie couldn't be there to have complete control like he did when he sculpted a model. But I knew that bronzes were important because they were popular, and this was a good way for Charlie to reach a bigger audience and for us to increase our sales. Everybody loved Charlie, and he said I had friends when I had nothing else, so he kept up with them as best he could by writing letters. But writing was such a trial for him. He struggled with writing in school. Back then, the teachers didn't know what to do to help him. He kept this disability all his life. So when it came to writing letters to his friends, well, they were more drawings than words. A couple of lines of words, and then an illustration of what he wanted to tell them about. 
Most people who got these letters held on to them over the years and cherished them as the works of art that they are. There are a number of these letters here in the Historical Society. They are old and fragile, and they'd fall apart if they will handle too much. The museum keeps them in these nice drawers specially lined to keep the paper from deteriorating. This way, we can look at these irreplaceable treasures as much as we want, and they won't be harmed. Museums have an important responsibility of preserving our heritage, be it letters and artwork like this, or other items, tools, furniture, clothing, books. They take care of these artifacts so that future generations will have the opportunity to enjoy and learn from the past. Oh, that's my very favorite picture. By the time Charlie came to Montana in 1880, the huge herds of buffalo were gone, but people were still alive who had seen a sight such as this. Charlie listened to their stories and imagined a landscape vast and open, that could hold what seems like an infinite number of these noble animals. Charlie was good at giving paintings titles, and he called this one, When the Land Belonged to God. He refers to a time when everything was untouched by the hand of people. He reminds us there once was such a time, and he wants us to wonder if we really have improved upon it now that we feel the land belongs to us. Charlie cared a great deal about nature, and as much as the West signified wide open spaces and plenty of room for wildlife and forests and rivers, he worried as time went on that people in his time were not doing enough to take care of the land and the animals, not paying enough attention to preserving natural resources that can't be taken for granted forever without some protection. He was inspired by nature, and hoped future generations would be able to enjoy it as well. This painting of a Kootenai Indian camp was on an easel in the studio when Charlie died. He was painting it for a man who wanted a picture of an Indian camp by Swan Lake. It isn't finished, and it leaves us an example of Charlie's technique for painting, how he put the whole idea down on canvas before he put in the details. And what details would he have put in to tell the story he had in mind? We will just have to use our imaginations. There is so much more to see of the collection here at the Montana Historical Society, and I hope that someday you will be able to visit and see it for yourself. Charlie once said that a person couldn't live enough lifetimes to paint all the ideas he had in his mind. But he just had the one lifetime to live his story. We all do and we try to do our best with it. Charlie loved stories and wanted to tell as many as he could about the West so that future generations like yours who cannot experience it as he did would know what our Western and Montana past was like. We're all living our stories, you, your friends and family, every one of us, and everyone is the hero in his or her own story. If Charlie were here today talking with you, He'd tell you to learn as much as you possibly can, believe in your dreams, and live your own story to the fullest.